So good afternoon, everybody. Thank you so much for being here on a Friday afternoon. My name is Aisha Hoda, and I was part of the Justice for the Newburgh Four Coalition formed in 2009 to support the four young men that were entrapped by an FBI informant in Newburgh, New York, over a decade ago. Uh, so we're gathered here today because this is one of the, ma the many outrageous cases that the Coalition for Civil Freedoms advocates for. Um, and CCF's legal team is actually filing compassionate release motions for three out of the four men who received harsh mandatory sentences. So I'll tell you a little bit about the case and how I came to learn about it. And then I'd love to hand it over to our panelists, including the family members of David McWilliams, one of the Newburgh Four. So first off, I wanna say that I actually live in Riverdale, the Bronx, um, where these men allegedly planted bombs. So this case is very close to home. Um, but in 2009, I was actually a teacher working in the Bronx, and I got a call from my grand aunt during lunch, freaking out because she heard that there was a bombing in the Bronx and I was there, um, and she knew I was working there. So the first thing I thought when she called me was, the Bronx? Who would want to blow up the Bronx out of all places? Uh, but I quickly ran to the TV, and sure enough, the story was not hard to find. Um, in fact, it was on every single news channel four black Muslim men plotting to blow up a synagogue and US military plane. So when I heard that four men from Newburgh were involved in such a large scale terror plot, something did not match up. The characters of this story seemed too familiar to me. Let down by the public education system, put in a situation where drug dealing seemed like the most uh, logical way to make a living, these four men were a typical case of a very race and class specific internal American experience. How could people dealing with such localized issues such as figuring out how to pay the next electricity bill all of a sudden be involved in such an international global fiasco? How do individuals who have barely left the state of New York and don't have a frame of reference past Newburgh, New York have a desire or capacity to be involved in making bombs and collaborating with an international terror cell? As the days went by, more and more information was revealed. Apparently, a government informant under the guise of Maksud came to their mosque in Newburgh and started preaching violence and hatred to members. Other members of the mosque steered clear of this man, including the Imam. However, this informant, according to other members of the mosque, specifically targeted black men who looked poor and found a way to convince them to listen through money. The informant offered $250,000 each, plus employment, cancer treatment for David's brother, and other favors and gifts to agree to this plot. The four men thought they could con the informant and get away with the money. But on May 20th, 2009, SWAT team jumped out of trees in a whole spectacle, and now these four men are facing 25 years to life. Um, so at this point, um, I want to introduce our panelists. Um, who's going to give you more in-depth information on the cases and why we're here today. Um, so we are very lucky to have um, the family members of David McWilliams here with us today. Um, Elizabeth McWilliams, who is, um, who is the mother of David. Um, um, we also have Alicia McWilliams, the aunt of David. Kiki McWilliams, another aunt of David. Um, and we also have um, two filmmakers, David and Kate, who created the film, uh, The Newburgh Sting. Uh, last, we have Kathy Manley, who is a lawyer who's actually working on um, compassionate release motions for three out of the four um, of the Newburgh Four. So um, let's get started by hearing from uh, the two filmmakers. So Kate Davis and um, David Heilbronner um, produced the award-winning documentary, The Newbury Sting in 2014. David Heilbronner is an award-winning documentary filmmaker who produced the Emmy-winning um, uh, documentary Jockey directed by Kate Davis and wrote and co-directed alongside Kate Davis again, the Peabody-winning Stonewall Uprising among other titles. He also worked as a Manhattan prosecutor, a criminal justice professor at John Jay College, authored two highly regarded books on criminal justice issues, and has spent years screened as a seminal work aimed towards overcoming transphobia. Um, so 
Uh, Kate and David, what got you interested in the case and why did you decide to make a documentary? Uh, well, yeah, I'm glad you mentioned my background because that's a big part of it. You know, I'm, I'm, I am passionate about criminal justice and I used to be a prosecutor and I left because I felt the prosecutors weren't always interested in justice. They were interested in winning cases and, and racking up convictions. And I was with a law professor of mine who felt similarly. And she said to me, um, you should take a look at the FBI and the um, Islamic community in America because something's, they're being surveilled, they're being targeted. And I think there might be a movie in there if you look hard enough. And so we looked at a lot of stories. And when we came, I came across the story of the Newburgh Four, I was, you know, I was really blown away. It just seemed, so outrageous that, that the FBI would come into an impoverished community and dangle a quarter million dollars to people who are, you know, barely able to make rent um, and provide them with a fake bomb and fake missiles and say, just do as you're told. And then all of a sudden the FBI goes to, and the FBI busts them in this dramatic bust. You know, there were air, there were, there were helicopters and there was, there was a bomb squad, and a bomb truck. And mind you, the FBI had created the bomb. There was no bomb there. This is all for, for show, all for PR. And then the FBI gets up in front of Congress and says, look, look at the great job we're doing fighting terrorism. And so I, but I didn't want to make the movie until I knew that we could really prove the point beyond, beyond contradiction. It's, you know, these cases often dissolve into he said, she said. And so we looked hard and found that the FBI had meticulously filmed every step of the way. And when we do film Q and A's, I often thank the FBI for their cinematography. Um, they filmed uh, their, their informant dangling this money in front of David, David McWilliams and, and James Cromedy uh, and Laguerre Payen among others. Um, and it, it became obvious that the world had to see the other side of the, the, the story that the FBI was handing us. And that's what got us into making the movie. Thank you. Um, so now I'd like to hear um, from the family members of David. Um, if you could each take a few minutes to talk about him as a person and maybe his motives to help his brother, Lord, um, who health, had health problems. Um, I guess we can start with Elizabeth. Um, David was, um working in New York, going to college. And um, I wound up taking my baby to the hospital, Lord. And they was like, um, you should call your family because we don't think he's gonna make it through the night. So obviously I didn't really want to call David because I wanted him to, you know, get his life together. But he came anyway. And I mean, just to hear the doctors tell you that your son and your brother is, about, is gonna die is like a mind blowing, like a blow to you. And he was sitting outside crying, like, mind you, he didn't even know James. Um, and James said, what's the matter? He said, my brother's going to die. My mother don't have the money. I actually met the informant. I actually was in the car with him twice. Um, David is just a caring person. He's like his brother's keeper. And so for him to, you know, sacrifice um, his life, his brother is... Um, kind of upset because as a mother, I, I was going to give my son some help, but he didn't know that. And then come to find out after the cancer, he needed a liver. So um, it's just, it's been tough. I have not seen my son in six years. And, and to, to hear him call me and tell me he's afraid to go to sleep because he's feel like he's going to die in his sleep. And He's, he's been stabbed in there. Um, he broke his bones in his foot and then take him to the hospital. And just to think that I don't want my child to die in jail. You know, and to think that he missed all of this and he's like my best friend. So for me not to see my son in six years. Like I smile every day, but I'm actually suffering on the inside because I look at his kids now and, you know, even when he talks to me on the phone, he don't want to tell me the truth that he's sick, but I already, I know he is like, and, uh, I'm just like at an oars right now. Like I'm might be, might not even be here. God willing. I mean, I hope I'm here to see my son come home. But I mean, I, I've had I've anxiety attacks. You know, every time I see 
the phone, and then when I call, and then they never um, had visits because they was on lockdown. And then for an officer, a guard to shoot at my son in the in the courtyard, and my son didn't move. I wouldn't even have a son right now. So it's a lot. So that's why I keep on his email so I know what's really going on with him. So if something happened to my child, I'm going to hold them accountable for it because as a nurse there, you can't deny him medical help because he has very serious medical problems in there. And David is just a sweet person. Anybody you talk to, very sweet. Thank you. As a mother. It's, it's like I, I was like I'm reliving it every day because I don't get to see my son. Yeah. Thank you, Elizabeth. Um, and I just wanted to say that, you know, when I asked for Elizabeth's bio, the first thing she said is, I'm a mother. Like, that's what defines me. And, you know, as a mom, like, I, I can relate to that completely. I can't even imagine what it's like as a mother to have a child taken away from you, especially under a circumstance that's so unjust. Thank you. Um, so Elizabeth um, is also a direct support professional and a licensed practical nurse. So it must really hurt you a lot that he's not getting the medical treatment that he deserves in prison. Yeah. Thank you, Elizabeth. Um, so now, um, Alicia. Alicia is one of the aunts of David, um, and she is a family activist, a community activist who has been part of spearheading the fight for the freedom of the Newburgh Four since day one. Uh, she spent countless hours standing strong in the midst of adversity. Um, she's also a former foster mother, not only for others, but for many of her nieces and nephews. Um, and she continues to triumph over many life circumstances. Um, Alicia likes to declare that it's not over until the fat lady sings and Alicia, she hasn't sung yet so it's not over so Alicia we'd love to hear from you um, talk to us about your nephew David I'm gonna keep it short because that's a joke I can't talk like I used to but I'm still trying to fight for him in my own way so I can't get out there and do like I used to. I did enough. It's her, her turn. It's, Liz got to take it, take over. Because, and now I'm really happy that my family is really getting involved. Kiki, my JJ, my brother. So my family coming out now. But it was a hard fight. It was my, even with my legs swollen, my feet swollen, up and down, up and down, and doing outreach. And we was out there, Asia, right, Asia? We did a, a lot of work. She did a lot of work with me. Pray God that I had this young lady with me. And we did a lot of work. We did a lot of work. And, and I'm glad from out of this, we got one family. We got more people in this case. And, and it's sad that other cases is still going on. And that's sad about it. But the government, I'm sorry to say, but dumb little motherfuckers, I could, I could cuss good. The dumb little motherfuckers is wrong. You can't come into our community and do that. And I don't even know how this case I'm still in the twilight that we still had this case because the government should have never did this in our community. So that's, it's really sad. Mm -hmm. Oh, something about David? Oh, I love David. That's my D. That's my D. He called me his, his hero. Mm -hmm. He called me his hero. He said, I'll tell you my hero or they didn't put me in in he said we, they would put him in the, yeah, put him under the jail. He said, so auntie, I love you for fighting for me. So God is good and I'm gonna do it the best I could. I don't know what we are gonna do, but we are gonna do something, you know, but God is good. 
We're okay, good. I'm done. Thank you so much, Alicia. I know it's a lot for you to speak right now with all the- Yeah, well now with the medical, the stuff, dialysis, I wasn't on dialysis when this started. And then now I have a stroke. So I got other medicals and stuff, but um, yeah, I'm still here. Yeah, you're still here. You're so strong, Alicia. Thank you. Um, Thank you. Uh, so now we're going to hear from Kiki McWilliams, another aunt of David. Um, Kiki has been a volunteer since 1998 as an assistant coordinator at the Community Outreach of Newburgh formerly known as Grace Tabernacle Family Outreach Center. She works with various organizations and places of worship in the community, distributing donations to families in need. So Kiki, if you could talk a little bit about David, his motivations, um, maybe Newburgh. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Um, David to me, um, as my nephew, uh, exemplified amazing strength. He always showed that he was interested in family and that it was about family. Um, just the closest that he has with his mother. I would always say they're like sisters and brothers because they just had this bond or have this bond that's just, it's just beyond mother and, and, and son. Um, and just to see the two of them together and just how he cares for his brothers and for his, his um, family members. Um, I recall many times when he would, you know, I would see him throughout Newburgh and he would always stop me and just embrace me. And his big hugs, his bare hugs and his humility, you know, he just was a humble, he's a humble man, you know, and I am very proud um, to be his aunt um, because of all of the respect that he has shown. He has carried himself amazingly. And even just to hear his, his voice and to hear, hear that he still is David, that he still, has the strength in him and that he has a fight that is within his depths of his soul. So as I watched him as a father, as a protector, you know, watching him protect his nieces and his nephews and his cousins and standing up for right and standing up for all others that are unable to really stand up for themselves. So as we fight as a family and as others are fighting with and for us, I'm not surprised that when I heard him on the phone um, when we were um, all together and just to hear him speak, he's speaking from his heart place and to hear his heart, you know, that is not a surprise to me because he is a man that spoke from his heart, loved from his heart, lived from his heart and was able to even walk throughout the community with his peers and others and have respect. My daughter who is 27, she calls him Uncle David and she said to me, I call him Uncle David because of how he treated me and how he showed me the love and how he cared for me and how he would look out for me when he saw her out in the streets. He would always say, what are you doing out here? So he was letting her know that being on the streets is not where it's at. So as he started to move <clears throat> forward in his aspirations and his desires to become a greater man, I am certain that he will be able to complete that course and he will be able to complete that dream because of who he is. So I, as Kiki, as his aunt, I'm just so proud that he is who he is. And I wasn't surprised that he extended himself the way that he did for his brother because he is one that is willing to sacrifice so that others can have and so that others can be. So as me, I'm just very proud of who he is, even in where he, even though he is, where he is, I'm still yet proud of him. Thank you so much, Kiki. Thank you. Um, so I'd like to hear from all panelists. So all of you guys, whoever wants to speak can answer this question. So what kind of person was Shahid Hussein, who was the FBI um, informant? And what experiences do you remember having with him? So the, uh, what, what do you want the audience about Shahid Hussain. Shahid Hussain was, was a uh, kind of, uh, he was a very slippery, low level crook who might actually have had ties to even bigger level criminality that is still being investigated. You know, he was faking driver's tests for people when he got nabbed by the government and they said, look, if you can help us, we'll help you. 
And his way of helping them was trying to set people up using people, good people like David, as pawns in the war against to save his own skin. And so Head Hussein has a huge history of lying, of running um, shady businesses. He ran a, a recently, he's still in trouble. He ran this, this car uh, limo rental service that, that rented terribly, terribly dangerous vehicles and people died in some of his, in, in a recent car crash. And they're still investigating that. Head so Hussein is a known liar whose government was more than happy to employ to find pawns in the war against terror that they could use and they didn't give they didn't they didn't give a goddamn about david williams as a person they just wanted to find someone who they could hang this on and his humanity and decency and kindness in his heart that everyone's talking about meant meant nothing to them you know this this was this was the fbi looked good yeah and, and, and the and levels of you know the levels of injustice were just so layered um are so layered in this story um you know, and I think as filmmakers, I mean, not only when we wanted to suggest that it is, of course, the government duping the public, you know, into thinking that we are fighting a brave, honorable war on domestic terrorists when they are not out there in force the way that, I guess, to keep the money flowing into Congress, keep Homeland Security going, they, they need to sort of prop up um, victims and, and call them, you know, our scariest members of society um and so we as taxpayers are being duped you know uh politicians are, are gaining um uh but really what we felt the film could begin to do anyway was uh, as we are doing here you know thanks to family members of david being here you know is to you know remind people that there are human beings behind every story like this that that and they are not the devil and they are not just sort of nameless and you know at least we locked them up and we don't have to think about them anymore um uh no david williams was really played and he had basically good intentions and in fact in the film there's a line where he says we're not gonna hurt anybody right i mean this was a night thing um and when nobody was at a synagogue where supposedly the bombs were going to go off um so it's it's really important i mean and you know, to Liz's point, every day he's still going through and as punishment for, you know, by the government, unnecessary extra punishment. Um, it's a so many levels. Um, Kathy, would you like to speak on Shahid? Oh, wow. Just uh, don't let me talk too long because, I mean, I could go on. Uh... Uh, I mean, I first heard about him when um, Yassin Araf was arrested in 2004 in Albany, New York, and I was working for, for the law firm. That was how I got into all this work in the first place, was from Yassin Araf's case. He and his co-defendant, Mohammed Hussein, were entrapped by Shahed Hussein and the FBI. And we learned at that time that about, you know, how Shahed Hussein had been caught for 50 felonies for... Um, fraud at the DMV for faking these driver's licenses and also working with a corrupt DMV employee to actually give people fake driver's licenses. Um, and uh, the more we looked into him, we found this whole trail of slime behind him where he had a slew of civil suits where he had cheated people. And then we would hear in the community, like my car mechanics locally mm -hmm. downtown Albany, they said, we take cash up front from that guy. I mean, which they don't do with anybody else. I mean, just little things like that, but all over the place. Anybody that's ever run into him <laughs> probably has a story like that. And that was only the tip of the iceberg that we found out then. And he was lying to the FBI in our case. Um, he was telling the FBI false things about the Urdu conversations with Mohammed Hussein and saying that Mohammed said he wanted to attack America when what he really said on that date was, I want to be a good American citizen. And then, you know, the translations came back later and, and we tried to bring this, you know, these lies into to evidence in the case and the, the judge wouldn't allow it because they, they said it's not relevant, that, that only what's on the, the actual tapes is, is relevant. Um, so he lied and he lied and, he, and they, he lied on the stand in our case a lot too. And, but it didn't matter because the tapes were the tapes, you know, and I don't even want to talk about our case because that was a whole different thing that we're not talking about right now, but, but it was super unfair. Both of these guys were innocent. Um, anyway, so after he lied so much in our case, I thought, well, they won't be using him again. They know he's a known perjurer. Why would they use him? 
And that was, you know, the trial in our case was 2006. And then uh, I get a call from, I think it was a New York Post reporter in 2008 saying, oh, he's at it again. He's, there's this other case that was right after, uh, no, 2009, was right after they got arrested in the Newberg case. And, and the reporter figured out that it was the same guy and actually confirmed it with me. We, had, we looked at it and sure enough, they were using him again. And then I realized, wow, I guess, you know, <laughs> they really like these super pathological liars, even though they lie to the FBI as well, they don't care. Um, and, I, and he lied so much in the Newberg case um, and the FBI knew it, they knew it all along, they didn't care. He lied um, about the $250,000 that he promised James Cromedy. Um, he said that was really a code word um, and, and nobody believed that, except I will say that the FBI lied to the jury in their closing argument, the, or the prosecutor and the FBI, but the prosecutor actually committed perjury in his closing when he said he believed Shahad Hussein about the, that the $250,000 was really a code word. Like he knew damn well that wasn't the case. And then on appeal that was challenged and the appeal court actually said, well, the jury knew better than to believe the prosecutor. The jury knew the prosecutor was lying to them. I mean, that's crazy. Um, so anyway, then after that case, I thought, well, now they definitely won't use him again because he lied so much in that case and so much more came out about him um, from the, all those uh, defense lawyers investigating him in that case and from the Newberg case. That, and the, the judge in the Newberg case she even wrote a letter to the bankrupts, to the prosecutors up in Albany and said, it looks like he committed fraud in his bankruptcy case because he had filed bankruptcy while he was getting all this money from his rich brother in Pakistan. Um, and, but they never of course pursued it because they love him apparently. And, but I thought, well, when, when he commits perjury that bad and to the extent where the judge is trying to get him prosecuted, um, they're not gonna use him again, right? Sure enough, they used him again in Pittsburgh, uh, get in another case, and uh, that that was a whole crazy case too that got made into a documentary called T Error, T Terror, um, because that was actually filmed. Um, anyway, you can find that on Netflix. But he was uh, actually used in that case as well, and he kind of uh, destroyed that case for the FBI. Although it was there was no case to begin with, but he kind of blew it up in their face. Um, so then he had all this money from the FBI and he started this limo company and uh, he claimed that the brakes had been fixed. Well, he actually, his, he got his son running it, but he was still calling all the shots, um, even though he was in Pakistan since March of 2018. In October, mm -hmm. I think 2018, there was this horrendous crash where 20 young people, 18 in the yeah. car and yeah. then two pedestrians, 20 people got killed in because this car had no brakes and it was coming down this hill in Schoharie, New York, not too far from here. And 20 people are dead because of this guy. And he's hiding in Pakistan and letting his son take the rap for it. His son's got 20 mm. manslaughter charges against him right now in Schoharie. So this is the kind of guy Shahad Hussein is. All right, I'll stop now. Thank you so much, Kathy. Um, now, I'd really love to hear your experiences, um, Alicia, especially Elizabeth and Kiki. Um, I don't know if you ever interacted with him, but I mean, some of the stories that I heard from Alicia about Shahid coming and giving toys, you know, to the kids with microphones in it. Like, talk to us about your experience with Shahid Hussein. Me? Yes, Elizabeth, please. Thank you. Um, when I first met him, um, he came over to me and he was like, I'm going to give your son a job. And I said, what kind of job are you giving him? He said, I have a clothing um, business. I said, okay. And it was just something about him that I really couldn't put my finger on. And then I was in the car with him and James and look, David, we were going to the hospital to visit Lord. And um, I noticed he had like four GPS in his car, but he kept acting like he didn't know where he was going. So we, in the, me and David is in the back seat, and I'm sitting with my arm around him. And there was a car that went past us, and he said, "We should kill those Jews." 
and I said, how do you know they're Jews? And he said, because they curls. And I proceeded to tell him to pull over and let me out the car. And I made the baby get out the car with me. I was like, I don't know what kind of person this is. And then the second time I was in the car, he took me to the bank. And um, he said, that'll be $10. I said, well, you should get the money from my son because he works for you. And then I told my son, I don't want him in my house. It's just something about him that it, I'm not putting my finger on. But as I'm looking back now, I noticed every time he came into, he always was in front of James' house. There always was a black car that came behind him, but it parked on the other side of Lake Street every time he came. And then it was the two black cars behind us when we were going to the hospital. Wow. So, and he said, you love, I, I love your son. I said, how do you say you love my son and you don't even know him? He goes, oh, I'm going to um, send you, you and your son to Disney World when this is all over. I'm going to have some doctors come to the hospital and um, take a look at your son. Wow. Can, can you explain, like, for people who don't know who Lord is and what health problems he had, can you explain a little bit about that? Um, at the time, my nephew was um, very, very ill. And I was going to New York to see my nephew all the time. And one day I came home and I was supposed to go to work, but I didn't go to work because I, I woke up with my stomach was like, felt like I was on a roller coaster. And then my house is where Lord room is down the hall. And I looked down the hall and I said, and I just dropped the phone because he looked like he was nine months pregnant. And I got him to the hospital. His platelet was 20. So that means he was about to die. And for three months, we stayed in the hospital. They didn't know what kind of cancer it was, what kind of test. And then it started in his spleen. And his spleen was seven pounds when they took it out of him. So his body was full of toxic. And then after that, I thought we was in the clear. Then they found some um, little tumors in his liver. And so we were doing chemo and um, because David took it very hard because when he went to jail um, for, uh, they wound up throwing it out though. He, he wrote Lord a letter and he had Lord put it on his wall in his room and had him read it every day to tell him that he don't ever want to see him come to jail. So that's why when Lord graduated from high school, it was a big deal for little David because he came because him and her son have a GED, but he was like, somebody got to walk across the stage for mommy. And so then Lord was um, not taking the medication because he heard David got 25 to life. So he was like, if my brother is gonna, you know, get life, you know, he don't, you know, can't live without his brother. Mm -hmm. So it's, it, I mean, he feels guilty that David did what he did for him. And the sad thing about it is I believe David would do it again. You know, so that's why I don't tell him when Lord, in the beginning when Lord was getting sick, I don't, I never used to tell him because I wanted him to um, not um, lose focus on, of him being in prison. And so, um, and when that man came to my house to pick my son up that day, I, I to tell you, I don't lie. I felt something and I was going to call little David and tell him that his daughter was in an accident because I know he would have got out of the car and came back. But I didn't, I didn't want to wish that on my granddaughter. And then when they kicked in, my dog came down with helicopters. I was like, what's going on? And I, knew, I didn't even know why they was in my house. I just thought they had a bomb dog. They took all of this, um, all of this evidence out of my house, which was nothing but CDs that I bought from James. James was selling CDs. So I'm like, what evidence did you take out of my house? Because there's nothing in there. David wasn't even living here. But they already had went to David's house in Brooklyn before they came to my house. So I just was like, he got me in handcuffs. I just brought my son home from doing chemo, and I'm in handcuffs. And I knew it was something big because the first thing I said to them, I was like, oh, my goodness, I hope David doesn't have any weed in my house. And then I seen all these papers on the table. I still didn't know what it was because I was having like an out of body experience. And then I knew it was big because he had marijuana and they didn't even take that. And then the lady wanted me to go to somebody else's house 
why they searched my house. I said, no, I'm not going to let you search my house and put something in my house that wasn't there. They took everything, the phone from the hospital, and then the government followed me all the way to Disney World with my granddaughter. They went to, um, they called Lord's girlfriend and told Lord, oh, don't forget you have a doctor's appointment tomorrow. They came to my house, was going to take my son to the hospital. I said, no, I'm not letting my son get in your car. So um, I just wish I would have just, um, but I, David was trying to tell people, I've spoken to plenty of people and he was trying, his, his teacher that was um, his counselor, when I saw him and he heard what happened, because me, David and Lord was all going to the same college. And he said he was trying to tell me something, but he, he just couldn't get it out. And then my, um, my ex-boyfriend's son is in the military and he spoke to him. He said he was trying to tell him something, but um, he didn't know how to tell him. So he was trying to tell people, but he didn't know how to tell people. Because the man showed him some pictures of people, family being slaughtered and told him that if you tell anybody, this is what's going to happen to your family. Because I asked David afterwards why you did it. He said, I was stuck. It was, I was either in or out because I wasn't going to let y'all get murdered because he did show him a lot of pictures. So he felt like he was trapped in it, couldn't say nothing. And so I just can't believe my son is 40. Thank you so much, Elizabeth. I know it's it's really difficult to relive all of this. Um, I don't know, Kiki or Alicia, did you encounter um, Shah the Sane at all? Or do you have anything you want to add? I didn't encounter him, but I remember um, just going through such uh, seeing my sister in so much pain um, in regards to her other son. And I remember her coming to me excited, you know, because she has already, you know, gone through what she was going through. And I remember her saying, Kiki, you know, um, David met somebody who's going to, you know, take you know, them on a, on a family trip. And I was really happy for her because I knew what she was going through. I remember when she received the news, I was there, you know, and watching her, you know, struggle with the pain of what she was feeling yet while she was still taking care of her nephew and, you know, my other sister um, and just looking out, you know, for others. And yet still she had issues going on with her son. So just to hear those news, I didn't have a specific, um, encounter with him. However, just hearing um, what my sister was able to convey to me and share with me in regards to him, I just assumed that he was just someone that was just looking out, you know, for my family. Thank you. That's a betrayal, right? Um, okay. So uh, because I know um, Kate and uh, David have to leave early. We're going to go to our um, last question for everybody, and then we'll come back to Kathy to talk about um, the compassionate release motions. Um, so why does this case matter? And what does it say about the intersection between racism, Islamophobia, and the abuses of the war and terror? Uh, we can start with you, Kate and David. <laughs> Wait, why, why does it matter? I mean, it, ma it matters because the FBI is, can behave as a rogue entity with a political agenda that entraps innocent people and throws them in jail mm -hmm. to, to follow, to, to further their agenda. You know, when, when right after this happened, Robert Mueller, who, you know, I, I've, I supported Robert Mueller when he went after Trump. So, it's, you know, I, everybody's complicated. But Robert Mueller went in front of the FBI and he said, we're doing a great job fighting the war against terror in the very first case out of his mouth was was the Newberg four and saying you know and these are four guys he said and we can't we caught this ring right right in the act these are four guys who didn't even know each other you know this is this is the FBI selling a bill of goods to the public so the case is important because the FBI needs to be reined in you know it's um it's dangerous when law enforcement becomes interested in its own survival and its own financial well-being because people just become numbers. It's one of the reasons why I quit being a prosecutor. You know, it's, it, these are real human beings out there with lives and families. And if people don't really understand that, 
we run a huge risk of, of having the FBI become a rogue entity that will just get more and more powerful and more and more dangerous. So that, that's my bottom line about why this matters. You know, we, we, and thank God you guys are fighting it. I mean, and the courts can help. You know, there was a great, there was a great appeals court decision in this case, even though it might have been a district court. It was a great legal opinion in this case, Judge McMahon's case opinion, because she really did call out the FBI. She ultimately uh, upheld what they did, which I think was wrong, but she at least had the courage to speak up. And I have to say, I gotta give it up to Alicia and the whole McWilliams family. Because when we made this film, a lot of people didn't want to go on camera. They're like, I don't want to talk against the FBI. Like, are you kidding me? That's, you know, they're going to come after me. This is not going to be good for me. I, don't, I didn't blame them for a minute, but without the McWilliams is speaking up, I don't know if we even could have made the movie. So you guys were brave. You continue to be brave. And I can't say how much I admire you for it. Um, mm -hmm. Alicia? You may have had a stroke, but man, you could still talk. You were, you are, you're dope. You're just, you're, you're great. Please keep it up, <laughs> people. Would you? you know, we need you. Anyway, it, it's my family. I didn't know how to fight back, but only my mouth. Yeah. <laughs> and that's what I did. Use my mouth. Well, thank you. Yeah, and you help. You're welcome. Other families feel comfortable to speak out. Yeah, you're, you're leading the way by example. Um, and it's just really important. We did take a of this film to the Senate, yeah. you know, and put the pressure on the FBI um, and the New York Times and any, all other journals did not question the factual, you know, the facts of the story as presented in the film. Um, you know, thanks again to all this in part to the footage that was provided with all these little cameras, hidden cameras. I love this family right here. Yeah. I was ready to take a bullet for my family. Because right otherwise this just keeps, if we don't speak up, it's just gonna keep happening. Yeah. And I didn't care. I just was protecting them. It was great. It was inspiring. And you know, we need everybody, everybody's gotta speak up, speak their truth, speak truth to power, you know, and like we got, you know, we, we, with your help, we got, we got pretty far. We did get it to the end. Like I have to say thank you to y'all for even wanting to do it. So thank y'all. Yeah. But Alicia, when you village. talk about the being in the twilight zone with what you went through, which I certainly can't imagine, not in your Yeah, show. I feel like I was in a twilight. Yeah. <laughs> Still am. <laughs> so, well, I, as a filmmaker, felt like I was cutting science fiction. This was a science fiction film. <laughs> like some kind of... <laughs> Hollywood thriller, yeah, right. You know, and I don't tend to be a conspiracy theorist at all. You know, I'm kind of skeptical, but still, Ripley's believe it or not. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's still sad. Yeah. I'm sitting here and she's crying because she don't get it out. She always locks it in. But I can still feel a pain from my sister. I can feel it. And sitting here and watching her crying, she's in pain. It's crazy because I'm just thinking, since I live in the neighborhood, I'm thinking of the fact that like the Jewish community here was terrified, right? But it's like, this wasn't even a real threat. The government even picked the location, right? So what is this doing to our communities, like creating fear between each other? Right, no, the people, I mean, think of the people who were victimized beyond, you know, the, 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 the four defendants. I mean, communities are pitted against each other. The Jewish community in Riverdale is terrorized unnecessarily. The Muslim community is tarred once again with the brush of terrorism, even though this mm -hmm. is a real thing, right? But it reinforces this image. And it is, you know, we suffer. The public suffers. The truth suffers. Uh, and, and, you know, the people who suffer the most are the four defendants, but it radiates out from there. It's not a, it, this is a national, this is a subject of national or international importance. So, thank also, you for joining us. Also, you think about all the resources that are spent fight in creating false, you know, uh, constructing their uh, cases such as this terrorist, so-called terrorist cases um, that could go towards fighting a real um, battle. Um, so that's, it, it, it's, it's, an incredible scam. It's a PR <laughs> scam of great magnitude that um, 
you know, that, that has reverberations. And today, maybe more than ever, you know, if we're really in a, a, such a polarized world, um, it's likely that there will be kind of hate groups that will jump on towards such stories um, because it allows uh, yeah. for, it, it, it's really condoned, it reinforces racism. Mm -hmm. So how can people yeah. see this film? Okay. Um, they can't see the film uh, because it was licensed to HBO for 10 years, but you know, it won a Peabody Award, it got nominated for an Emmy, it won lots of other awards. So we're gonna, it, it's, it's easy for us to get it out there. We've just been incredibly busy. We need to, it'll either go to Netflix or Amazon or one of the streaming services. Um, and I'd like to do it within the next few months. So uh, stay tuned, but it's, yeah. it's remains relevant it is important and we will have no trouble getting it out there it's honestly the failure failure is ours it's just you know our license expired and you, right. you um, know like when your driver's so, license expires oh, yeah, you can go to the, you have, you have so to go back to the for 10 years but he's going to try to get it out so we'll, we'll, we'll get it out again for sure okay anyway listen thank you guys for having us this is this is an honor and and i just yes you too mm -hmm. so i'm so to with you, you guys you know, keep you fighting. Too. And let me know what I can do to help. We're here. Thank you so All much. Right. All right. Thank you. Right on, guys. Good to see you. Kisses. Kisses back. Bye, <laughs> Okay. So I think at this point, um, it's time for Kathy to speak about the case and provide updates on the actions she's taking to get the Newberg Four out. Um, and once again, Kathy Manley is a criminal defense attorney and the legal director of the Coalition for Civil Freedoms. Um, and Kathy's main emphasis is criminal defense and constitutional rights, and she concentrates on appeals. So Kathy, take it away. Thank you. All right, thanks. Um, first, I, I also want to talk about how Alicia inspired the formation of CCF, really, because she brought the families together. Aisha organized an event in, I think, 2010. Alicia stood up and got all the family members to come up on stage and hold hands and said, we're all one family. And that was kind we're of- the one family. That's my oh, big yeah. one family. The family members, I'm a lawyer, but mostly it's family members and we're, you know, getting together to support each other and fight for your loved ones, our loved ones. Um, so, but the, okay, so I, I want to just like answer that last question about the racism, Islamophobia and why it matters, because that'll lead into what I want to say too. So, I mean, it was racism, obviously, because the, the um, Shahada Sin was targeting black people at that mosque, poor black people. It was an example of black people getting screwed by the criminal justice system again, in a particularly outrageous way. Um, and it was obviously Islamophobia because they were just looking for doing it in the name of Islam and it wasn't really Islam and Shahada Sain's not even really Muslim and they you know it's just all about having to um, make Muslims seem like terrorists when they're really not and uh, the it's about entrapment and so there's supposed to be an entrapment defense and I just want to talk about that a little bit and then I'll talk about compassionate release um, because that's another another reason why this case matters is that it shows how we don't really have an entrapment defense because what happened in this case is sort of the definition it is the definition of entrapment here you had people James and also of course David and Anta and Laguerre those are the four defendants not one of them had any interest in terrorism whatsoever and the government had well the government couldn't show that they did. There wasn't a single piece of evidence. The only thing they could say is that they that when Shahed Hussein offered them a lot of money, they talked a good game. They were just trying to get the money. They were desperately poor. David was trying to get money to help his brother. Um, so they would say things, you know, but they weren't they didn't do anything. They didn't even do anything when Shahed Hussein asked them to, like the FBI said, well, we got to get them to do something, get them to at least like find a map. The, the FBI picked the targets, gave them everything they needed, gave them the money. And they, they didn't even find the maps that they were asked to find. They did nothing for it except talk. They were just trying to con the 
informant and he was conning them. And, you know, well, we know how it turned out. But the way the entrapment defense works is um, if the government gives you, offers you lots of money, like they did here, $250,000, um, then the, that's called inducement. All right. So that's definitely happened here. Then um, in order to show entrapment, um, the gov in order to defeat the entrapment defense, the government has to show that the people were predisposed to commit this crime. Pre predisposed is supposed to mean before they were given, offered all this money, right? But that's not what it means because there was no evidence that any of them had ever said or done anything showing any interest in this at all. It wasn't like people who say, oh, somebody should do something about what the U.S. is doing to Muslims, which is protected speech, and then they get targeted, and then they'll try to use their speech. These guys had no interest in any of that. Like, they just had nothing to do with it. And yet, um, the way the uh, defense works now is it, if the people don't back out of the plot, if they have a ready response to being offered all this money and say, yeah, I want the money. Yeah, sure. I'll do this. But what, maybe they have no intention of doing it and they actually did nothing. Um, the jury was told that because they didn't back out of the plot, because they didn't hesitate, because they said, OK, I'll take the money. That means they were predisposed. That's a definition of predisposition. So that means that we have no entrapment defense. Because how is the jury supposed to acquit them? Because, you know, from what they were told, they weren't entrapped according to the legal instructions. And those legal instructions are wrong, which is why we are trying to create an actual entrapment defense in our ego bill that CCF is working on trying to get introduced in Congress. Because there's a lot of other people, a lot of other cases too, but this is kind of the classic example where there was nothing you could even remotely call predisposition and yet they still got convicted and the fbi created the case in such a way that they had to get 25 years there was no way that judge could give them less than 25 years because it was a mandatory minimum sentence for the the crime that the fbi created for them so that's why we're trying to go back now and file compassionate release motions this was something that could not be done until after the First Step Act was passed. It went into effect in 2019. And we started thinking about who could we possibly do it for and, and seeing how it was. Um, we thought it was mainly for medical conditions, um, like really, like you had to be terminally ill almost or over 65 and really, really sick. So we were looking at some cases for that. But then what happened was the pandemic hit. So we started filing a lot of compassionate release motions based on COVID risk for people that were over 65 or had like certain really serious medical conditions. Um, and then, so anyway, <laughs> we realized that now that um, we're kind of done with the COVID motions, everybody's getting vaccinated for the most part, or they're saying they don't want the vaccine in prison. Um, now we're able to go back and say, okay, we can file this and put it before the same judge who wrote that decision that uh, David Hellbrenner was talking about. That was a, she said a lot of good things in there that I'm going to quote back to her now and say, look, you, you said this was unfair in these, these ways, and but you had no choice. You had to give them the mandatory minimum. Guess what? Now under the First Step Act, for any extraordinary and compelling reason, you can give them time served. You can reduce the sentence. And it's happened in, in various cases that had mandatory minimum sentences where the um, sometimes it's because the laws changed and now they could be eligible for a lower sentence if they were sentenced today, but it wasn't retroactive. So people use compassionate release motions in those Everybody. cases. I think we can do it Bye. here. They, it, was, it was really unfair that they got that 25 years and the judge knows it. And now she can do the right thing after all these years, even though they shouldn't have done the time they've done. But, you know, they've done more than half of that time already, right? So um, now we're hoping to file it within the next month or so. And it's for David and Anta and Laguerre. I wrote to James twice. I didn't hear back from him. So we're going to do it for those three. And I'm, I'm hopeful um, that the judge will uh, 
grant this and let them out or at least reduce the sentence a lot hopefully let them out right away because that that's only fair and she can't give them back the years they've lost but hopefully let them out and uh the one what was i gonna say um anyway yeah i'll leave it at that for now thank you so much kathy uh, for all the work that you guys are doing um so at this point we're almost at an hour so i just wanted to give everyone a few minutes for any last words, anything that you want to get out about David, about the case, about the relevance. Um, and then we want to end with a special treat, a song from Kiki. So before the song, um, Kathy, Alicia, Elizabeth, any last words? I just want to thank um, Kathy. I'm grateful that she um, helped my son. I'm grateful to everyone, mostly my sister, for making this, to putting this up front when I couldn't do it. And um, I just can't wait for that day where I could just hug my son and smell it. Smell how sweet he smells. And I'm just grateful. That's all I can say. I'm very grateful for everyone who's um, doing something that I can't do right now. Now you could do it, because I can't do it. <laughs> I can't do it like I used to. But um, I want to see justice mm -hmm. in this case, you know, because the government was really government. It was, it was, they was wrong. They was really wrong to do that. So I just can't wait. Even if I can't do it, my nephews and nieces will fight in this case for justice. That's it. Thank you. Um. <laughs> Kiki, any last uh, comments before you sing? <laughs> I also wanted to thank um, everyone um, in regards to not only just the support, you know, because support is support, but when there's love and when there's unity, <clears throat> when there's strength, when there's hope. And I thank everyone for their countless hours, you know, of their, you know, hard work. And I really yes. honestly wanted to say a few words in regards to the racism, um, because, you know, anytime there's a divide, then people can't come together in their strength. And for the government to create this divide in the community that was already impoverished, you know, everyone started to scatter and go their own way. Um, and even as my family, my family was already broken and we was working on healing and then we were shattered, you know, and now we're still trying to pick up the pieces. Um, so it's so important um, that we one keep the hope, but I'm so grateful, you know, for everything that was actually um, done, not only on other cases we have, but on my nephew's behalf. Um, because he is important to us, you know, and he, he means so much to us and he's, he's missed. He's definitely missed. And, and it's unfortunate that there wasn't injustice. However, I'm very grateful that we were chosen for such a cause because Alicia was able to step out in front and not only help others, but begin to fight for the family, even in a greater way. So it gave a voice to other families to speak to, this is not acceptable because otherwise others would have continued to hide. So for that, I'm very grateful. Thank you so much, Kiki. Um, and Kathy, um, last words and also like for people watching who are upset about this, like what can we do at this point? How can we support the well, cause? You can support CCF. We're doing this for this case and a lot of other cases. Um, and I, I just also want to salute Kiki and Alicia and Liz and Aisha for, for your courage to speak up and organize. And uh, it, we might be looking for letters or a petition when, when I file this, but I'll have to think about that. But uh, I'm hoping, hoping, hoping that we can get a good result here with this motion. Um, Me too. Yeah. So civilfreedoms.org, is that the website for people who want to go check it out? Um, um, we're about to launch a new website. 
um, within the next couple of weeks, I think. So, but yeah, civilfreedoms.org. Once the documentary is accessible again, I highly recommend it because you can hear people talk about it. But like when you see some of the video footage of David and the other uh, three guys talking and you hear they're like, well, we don't want to hurt anybody. Like you really feel like emotionally how unjust this is. Um, so yeah, I, I highly recommend just like maybe a month or two from now, hopefully it'll be up on Netflix or Amazon. We should keep checking. It's called the Newberg Sting uh, for those of you who have never heard of this case before. So thank you, Kiki. Go ahead now. You're ready. <laughs> this um, is actually written and it says David Williams IV. And I'm going to read this first and then I'll sing. Tears dripping down your mother's face, heart dripping nonstop, no end to the pain until you come home, David Williams IV. Missed by us, but none greater than your mother. Pain so deep she holds on to your brothers. Gripped pain like a heart attack in the present moments. Unheard cries, she screams, I want my son freed. Feeling abandoned, left alone. Hurt speaking loud and clear from the depths of her soul. I want my son freed. I want my son freed. David Williams the fourth. We want you home, a son, a brother, an uncle, a nephew, a father. New light shall shine from dusk to dawn to remind you, we are still expecting you to come home. Many fight for you as an open-ended sentence incomplete, expecting to the day when you come home and we all will live to see you free. David Williams the fourth. Freedom, oh, freedom. Hey, 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 hey. free him, oh, free him. David Williams, the fourth. Oh, free him. Oh, freedom. David Williams, the fourth. Free him. Oh, free him. We want him free. Oh, oh, oh free him. Oh, 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 freedom. Oh, oh, oh freedom. Oh, freedom. Oh, oh, freedom. David Williams, the fourth, we want to see you free. Freedom. Oh, oh freedom. Free freedom, oh, oh, freedom. David Williams the fourth, I string your name, David. We wanna see you home, David. Oh, oh, David, 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 we want to see you home, David. So I cry out, 
Free him. Free him. Free him. Free him. Whoa. Free him. Thank you so much. That was beautiful. You have such a beautiful voice. Um, so at this point, um, we're going to close. Thank you so much to all the panelists. Thank you so much, Kiki, Alicia, Elizabeth, Kathy, um, for such an informative and emotional uh, webinar. Uh, I don't even know what to say. Um, we're just gonna keep fighting. Yes. We're, we're gonna keep fighting. And, and for those people who are listening right now and they're saying, you know, this is a really sad story, but you know, these guys, you know, they did agree to something kind of, you know, crazy. Cause I know some people for the first time when they hear this, there's a little skepticism. I just really want you guys to reflect and think what kind of um, American social institutions failed these men, failed David, the healthcare system, the education system, you know, the criminal justice system, like um, social services to help with employment. What kind of, um, American institutions failed to lead um, an individual to get stuck in a situation like this, right? So thank you guys so much. Um, and we'll definitely keep in touch. You better call thank me. Thank you. Yeah, I need to call you. For sure. <laughs> yes, honey. I got to know I her. miss you. I miss you. <laughs> Thank you guys so much for coming. Thank you.